You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Do you have reason to believe that before this night is over, Russian forces will be engaged in something akin to a full invasion of Ukraine? Uh, I do. Now it is up to Congress to confront this egregious assault on our democracy. Jesus, please help us. This morning, as new videos show the inferno that engulfed Lahaina and how residents spent hours in the ocean to survive, anger is growing. Israel is now fully poised to annihilate the Gaza Strip. Revenge for last weekend's horrific terrorist attacks that were meticulously planned and executed by Hamas. With the unrelenting assault, it's a scramble to get the help. The dead and wounded arrive by ambulance. There's no shortage of chaos around the world right now. I don't have to tell you that. It's everywhere. It can feel scary. It can feel overwhelming. And it's been years now. For a country of our population, and frankly, for a country with a military as small as ours, Canada has traditionally managed to play an outsized role on the global stage. We've often been known as peacekeepers, something that uh, maybe we could use right now. Much of our international influence can be traced, of course, to our relationships with much larger powers. But not all of it. Canada is also one of the world's most attractive countries for immigrants. And we have been known, at least in more recent decades, to welcome everyone. And that helps us too. So as small as we might be in terms of overall population and military might, we do have some influence and power to wield. Are we doing it? What exactly has Canada done as the globe has become more chaotic? Amid conflicts and climate disasters, a renewed rise of authoritarianism, and everything else we're seeing. Years ago, a marketing slogan embraced by everyone from booksellers to American presidents proclaimed that the world needs more Canada. So what does the world need from Canada right now? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Louise Blais is a former diplomat and a representative to the United Nations. She is also currently a foreign policy analyst. Hello, Louise. Hello, Jordan. Thanks for finding time for us today. So happy we're having this talk. Well, I really am too, because I think uh, given everything that is going on in the world right now and and has been for the last two, three years now... um, a lot of people feel like uh, Canada doesn't have a role here and and hasn't done much. Um, let's just start with that. Like, what have you seen from uh, Canada over the past few years, and what should our role be here? Well, it's, it's very interesting, as you mentioned. I'm, I'm now a, a foreign policy analyst, but I was a diplomat for a long time, and it seems as the moment I left diplomacy and started this work as a consultant, the world decided to get that much more complicated. <laughs> um, but it, it definitely has. And I think part of it, the, the roots of those um, crises that we're, we're seeing were there and should have been recognized before they erupted. But I think many people didn't see some of these trends coming. They saw indications of it. And one of them was, and this is something that ties back to your question about Canada's role and how we're seen around the world. I think we've been slow in the West and in Canada to see the rise of the global South, the developing countries of the world that are becoming more and more assertive on the world stage at the UN as an example. But they are also now becoming proxies of superpowers Hmm. in this competition that we're seeing around the world. So we're seeing this play out in the Middle East today, and we certainly have been seeing it in in the Pacific. Uh, Latin America and Africa, we're seeing certain countries that are in competition with the West flex their muscles in those areas and, and, and those uh, regions of the world and develop allegiance that I think we've been a little slow to prepare for or to, to counter. 
How has Canada traditionally seen itself and its role in the world? When we look at ourselves as a country, I think uh, a lot of people would have an image of us that maybe uh, we don't have on the world stage anymore. I think that we have had an outsized perception of our influence over the past, I would say, 10 to 15 years. I think historically Canada had... uh, had an important role for a whole variety of reasons. But one of them was uh, the fact that back in those days, really, the world was sort of controlled by, you know, a handful of countries. And Canada was part of that group, the G7. Then we helped create the G20. We were part of a lot of clubs. Historically, we've had Canadians that have distinguished themselves uh, internationally, you know, Lester B. Pearson, to name uh, just one. And so We've always had this sense that Canada was punching above its its weight. And for a long time, we really were. And when the UN was founded, for example, there was just less than 50 countries that joined. So you have, you know, one out of 50, you have a stronger voice. Mm-hmm. But as the world expanded, as other countries as a step forward and emerged, uh, Canada, I, I think, did not fully recognize that our role was diminishing. And And whether that's something that we should have resisted, that I'm not so sure. I think you look at how countries of similar, well, or relative similar size and importance in Europe conduct their foreign policy. And I'm not talking here of France or Germany, but let's talk countries like the Nordic countries. They don't necessarily weigh in on every issue. Hmm. They don't necessarily try to do everything. They choose certain areas in which they're going to want to exert influence and then They focus on those. Canada, we've been really dispersed. We've been in la francophonie, Commonwealth. We had a voice in just about every room, but over time, that voice really got crowded out. And um, part of it, you could say, is a little bit of our retrenchment on certain issues. And part of it is just what happened around us. One of our uh, frequent guests who we talked to about uh, national security, Stephanie Carvin, we were talking last year about Uh, Canada and China's uh, obviously fraught relationship. And one of the things she said is, like, if you look at it over the last decade or so, Canada just doesn't even have uh, a foreign policy. What do you think about that statement? I completely agree with Stephanie. And I I think we, we would benefit, I think, from having a national conversation to develop a foreign policy that is probably more directly tied to our immediate interests and security. I think our interests are in two baskets. One is sovereignty and security, and the other one is economic and prosperity. Right. And I think we haven't really done the full analysis of what it is that we should be doing to advance those interests. Because what I see us do is often reaction to world events. We formulate positions on the go. Mm-hmm. We sometimes do it in a way that is not really reflective of, of deep-rooted interests, Canadian interests. You mentioned earlier, you know, one of the reasons uh, our presence is diminished is the rise of the global south. And also, you know, it's it's difficult to have an outsized presence when there are so many crises in the world. But how much of it is that, is the changing nature uh, of foreign diplomacy uh, across the world? And how much of it is us, our government, uh, pulling back from committing to uh, a strategy across the world? Well, I think it's, it's both those things happening together that I think are having what I would call a negative impact. We're still in the mindset of trying to change the world and into the, our own image. We're still not quite willing to have this view that we live in a world that we don't all control, that we cannot change, and we have to be pragmatic about it, realistic about it, and we have to choose our battles and operate in areas where we do have influence, and that influence will actually benefit Canadian interests. Where are those areas? What could we be focusing on where we can make a difference uh, if we put our weight behind it? I would start with our region. I think we have to come back to our own hemisphere. And I think that involves improving and deepening our bilateral ties with Mexico, for example, that I think we always see Mexico through the prism of our relationship with the United States. And I think we're losing a lot of opportunities to partner with uh, very much a like-minded, on many fronts, uh, ally who mm-hmm. shares our own neighborhood. Then deeper than that, Central America and the Caribbean and Latin America. And I think at the same time, I would look north. I think Canada is a Nordic country. It defines who we are. 
There are interests that are very fundamental in the Arctic, especially as climate change is setting in. Mm -hmm. We have a neighbor that is uh, has propensity to uh, think nothing of of invading another country. And so we have to prepare for that outcome. And I don't want to be alarmist here, but I think along the way, we there are signs now, they're very clear to us that we have imperialistic competitors that are happen to share a part of the Arctic. Just to give you an example, when the Russian Federation invaded Ukraine, all the, understandably, members of the Arctic Council kind of recoil and we stopped engaging with Russia on the Arctic. Hmm. And those activities were slowed. I would say we need to go back to re-engage the Arctic Council because those issues are not going away and we cannot afford to close the door of dialogue with Russia when it comes to our Arctic sovereignty and managing that region. Since you mentioned Russia, uh, I'll ask, I mean, a big part of why we wanted to speak to you and try to get a sense of the role Canada could play is because we wonder when we see, especially conflicts around the world, which seem to be um, escalating over the past couple of years, we used to think of Canada as a nation of peacekeepers. And I guess, have we moved away from that? Or is that role just not even possible for us anymore? It's such a great question because for so long, up until recently, I think Canadians really, we we felt we had invented the concept and we were a partie prenante of, of the movement of peacekeeping, which has been as a force generally for good at the UN over the past several decades. But the fact of the matter is there are two things that are making that more difficult today. One is our own capacity to contribute because we've neglected our military. Right. And that's, you know, that's a whole other avenue to discuss. So our capabilities are greatly reduced. Second, peacekeeping has changed over the course of many decades. And, and now a lot of countries in Africa, for example, are really, this is an activity, this is something we fund them to do. They basically build peacekeeping forces for their own continent. And there's something to be said about having regional forces on the ground, as opposed to shipping strangers from halfway around the world to try to keep the peace in another uh, region. So uh, peacekeeping has evolved. I think there are still things that Canada could be doing in a peacekeeping environment. We're still respected for our views and at the UN on peacekeeping. But I think that because of the nature of the peacekeeping environment today, it's not a top priority, I think, for Canada. And I, I often hear commentators who say that one of the big reasons why we lost our last bid for the UN Security Council, uh, which I was an intimate part of, was because of our peacekeeping record of the past 10 years. Huh. And I can honestly say that in all the conversations that I've had with all the other countries, ambassadors of the other countries, as we were trying to bring them on side to vote for us, not once, and I mean it, not once did I have a country raise this issue with us to say, well, we're not going to vote for you, or we think Canada is is, uh, is neglecting its responsibilities, you're not doing enough for, for peacekeeping. Not one raised that as a priority for, for what they would want Canada to do. So I thought that was very enlightening. What do other countries want us to do? Well, the very first thing they want us to do is to listen. Listen to them, listen to what their own priorities are, and partner with them where we can. That's the bottom line. I don't think they need Canada. And now I say other countries, and I need to make a difference here, between governments, which are the official interlocutors with whom we interact, whether they're elected or not. At the UN, we have to interact with everyone. So that's who I'm referring to here. I'm not talking about populations that may want Canada to come in you know, save them from their oppressive regime. Mm -hmm. I'm half joking here, but you know what I'm saying. Right. No, I get it. Yeah. You know, so, you know, when Canadians travel around the world and they say, oh, Canada is so admired, so loved, uh, and everyone wants to migrate here, that's all true. But if you speak at governments of these other countries, you're not going to get that same answer. Hmm. Yes, you're going to get the admiration of Canada. Yes, you're going to get the sense that we could be great partners. You will, though, here, if you really listen, because they do tell us, we don't need you to lecture us on how we should be managed. And we don't need you to meddle in our uh, domestic issues. And Canada has been seen for right or for wrong to have engaged in that kind of activity. Hmm. We will sometimes fund NGOs, 
in our bilateral aid program that are anti their local government on issues related to gender, reproductive rights, or LGBTQ issues. Now, I'm not passing comment on whether we should or not, but you pay a price for that right. with the government who says, well, these are not our priorities. You're not respecting what we would like you to partner with us on. So that's what they say. And that's why sometimes they don't vote for us. And because they feel that we just go over their head and we do what we feel would be right for their constituents. Over the past several years, how much does the onslaught now of polarization play a role in what Canada decides to or or more likely decides not to do? And I ask this because, well, you just mentioned, you know, LGBT uh, NGOs. There's certainly an incredible amount of polarization on some of the biggest issues and biggest crises in the world. And you know, I can't think of an issue out there that's that's really important where Canada could take a stand uh, that wouldn't be split here at home. And how difficult is it for a government to develop a foreign policy when it's, uh, it must be hard to get a picture of what Canada as a nation of people actually want their government to do? Of course, that's right. And, but that does not mean that we should shy away from having that conversation. Because while the government at the end of the day has to take into consideration what they're hearing, but they have to make the final decision. But if they're making that final decision based on what is a direct interest to the vast majority of our population, of our country, then they can't be going wrong. And But they have to be able to communicate the whys of those decisions. Hmm. And sometimes that means that we know we're not going to go and do something that would feel good in the moment where we would have defended a certain right of a certain individual on the world stage or a group of people. I believe we need to continue to be uh, advocates for human rights. And, and, and I'm glad that we're running for the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Mm-hmm. But I think there are times where we may not opine or take a position for reasons of national interest. And if you explain that clearly, why we're going to pick the areas where we are going to lean in, then I think maybe Canadians will have a better chance of understanding. And let me just add, you can debate whether we're still the middle power, but let's assume that we still are. So we're big enough to be a target, to be made an example of on something because our ability to push back or ability to inflict damage in return is limited, present but limited. But let's face it, with some of the little crises we've had of late, with whether it was with Saudi Arabia, whether it was with China, or more recently with India, our ability to to really get our way or to, to really advance our position on this is very much dependent on whether the Americans will back us. Right. And to some extent, the UK or France. So because we need sometimes, and for good or for bad, the Americans in our corner, that basically means that we could be made an example. So we could be targeted, and messages could be passed through us. And there are things that countries will do to us that they will never do to the United States, not directly. Hmm. And so we really do have to be careful on when and how we stick our neck out because of that fact. Because at the end of the day, that's not in the best interest of Canadians. Isn't the mark of a coherent foreign policy, though, having um, an innate understanding uh, of when it is worth uh, sticking our neck out for values that we see as critical to uh, what makes us Canada, even if it goes against, you know, keeping the peace and diplomatic objectives and getting our next seat on whatever council? Well, it's a, obviously, we have to seek that equilibrium. Uh, foreign policy and diplomacy is not the easiest of, of activity. Mm-hmm. There's going to continue to be difficult situations where no matter what we do, there'll be a price to pay on one side or the other. I think it's important, though, that that we have nuanced uh, positions that are uh, fully explained. I think the way that our policy on the Middle East over the past several months has evolved, I think I welcome it, quite frankly, compared to where we were before. I know that <laughs> it happens to not please anyone because it seem to be right in the middle. But right. on the other hand, that's was. That was success at the UN. If everyone was angry at you, you knew you got the best compromise you could have. Right. Sometimes there's valor in that. Sometimes the middle ground is the better way. And I think that's what we're seeing now. 
But I think if you've got an overall framework of where really uh, our priorities are going to be, you can never totally predict all that the world w- will throw at us, but you have at least a, a in-between basis where you're operating in a thoughtful way that that will be helpful. The last thing I want to ask you is about um, how our policy or lack of policy might or might not evolve in the future. You know, we've had uh, the same government now for almost a decade, and I'm not saying we're in a campaign now or anything, but I think the polls would tell you that uh, it looks as though during the next election, there's probably going to be a change in government. Would that uh, change our approach at all? And do we know anything about uh, Pierre Polyev's approach to foreign policy and how it might uh, differ from Justin Trudeau's? I feel like all we've talked about uh, in terms of politics so far are domestic issues, and I don't get a sense that I know uh, what would be different. No, you're quite right. I, I don't know either. So we'll have to wait and see uh, if there is a change of government, what, what, what would change. But I, I think that there are certain big national projects that should be bipartisan and should be national. And we would have a better chance of getting back on the UN Security Council, no matter how, how flawed it may be. It's still an important room and there's a lot of work to be done, you know, in and outside of what is voted on, on the council. I would like to see a future run for the UN Security Council be a national project, bipartisan project. But that's what's needed is to just make certain big, big international decisions bipartisan. And that way there's consistency. And I think for a country of our size, that would that would probably uh, be more advantageous in the long term with changes, you know, on the fringes, but some basic fundamentals that wouldn't change from one government to the other. That does sound like a nice dream. I (laughs) hope we get it one day. Louise, thank you so much for this conversation. It's fascinating. Jordan, thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Louise Blais is a foreign policy analyst and a former representative of Canada's to the United Nations. That was The Big Story. For more, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can, of course, leave us feedback and suggestions for future episodes by emailing hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or by picking up the phone, calling 416-935-5935 and leaving us a voicemail. As I mentioned, we've been getting a ton of feedback. We're working on putting it all into an episode for you so you can hear what everybody's thinking and hear what we have to say about it. Uh, But we value every piece of feedback and every suggestion you send us. So keep doing it. It's been amazing. The Big Story is in every single podcast player, and it's on every single smart speaker. All you got to do is ask them to play The Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.